Let me begin by welcoming you all to the uh, panel discussion on cloud computing. Uh, my name is Roger Cochetti. I'm the principal at RJC Associates, where we provide advisory and consulting services in the information technology, e-commerce, and internet spaces. I'm joined by a fair, fairly impressive uh, panel, which I'll introduce in just a few moments. Um, but before doing that, I want to say um, a few things about cloud computing to kind of frame the discussion. Um, uh, about six months ago, the Washington Post invited me to write an opinion piece on the subject of policy issues associated with, pl with cloud computing. And last uh, May, I was, I was pleased to do so. And part of my charge was to identify all of the policy issues um, associated with uh, cloud computing in a few hundred word article. That, of course, was impossible. Um, but it did, um, the article did, and, and my research for it made clear that um, the subject is incredibly complex. Um, before describing some of the complexity of, of uh, cloud computing, I thought I would touch on three things. First of all, um, how it fits into the history of um, information technology and, and the computer industry. Um, the uh, distant ancestor of uh, cloud computing was a service that emerged in the 1960s um, called Timeshare. And for those of you who think that's a condominium in Orlando, long before such things were offered, uh, mainframe computers, access to mainframe computers was shared um, uh, remotely uh, by customers who would use the computer time for brief periods of time. And in a sense, the computer services were in a cloud for them. So a large company like Aetna Life and Casualty might purchase a computer, but it might sell access to it between 3 and 4 a.m. to a smaller company like Geico and um, create a cloud-like um, computer environment. Um, that was almost a uh, half century ago that the first uh, type of, of, of cloud service um, emerged. It was followed by a period of 30 years of, of what w w the industry is generally thought of as increased uh, distributed computing, where um, the goal was to bring computing closer and closer to the end user and to create freestanding computer environments all the way down to the micro, mini, laptop, uh, desktop, and, and smaller and smaller computing um, facilities, each of which was independent and relied on no central computing, which itself was followed by the period of what's called network computing, where computers began to be networked, reaching its uh, zenith in um, the internet and the network of networks, which uh, connects all or nearly all networks with uh, with each other. And that was the predicate and laid the groundwork for the era of cloud computing that we have today, where um, computer services are available almost ubiquitously um, and the uh, era in which you need to be freestanding and independent in software services capabilities um, is now giving way to the era in which um, you rely on the cloud for um, these services. There are three things about cloud computing, I think, that make it complex in a policy environment. It's complex in a technical sense, but it's in the policy implications, three of them um, stand out to me, and I think the panelists will touch on these in greater detail. One is that um, it separates end user, um, vendor or merchant, um, and, and operator into three different uh, pieces. So, and, and very often the uh, merchant or vendor is not in any way the database operator, um, and database operators um, sort of come and go invisibly to the, um, um, to the end user. Secondly, um, it's uh, wide use among consumers, whereas that ancient system of timeshare was really one enterprise using another enterprise's um, computer time. Um, what we have today is uh, the, the, the uh, uh, penetration of cloud computing services into almost every facet of the lives of consumers. 
and uh, ranging from medical to um, family, social, and, and every other um, aspect of consumers' lives. Then thirdly, um, the globalization of uh, cloud computing, partly driven by the dramatic reductions in telecommunications um, expenses, making it possible to link uh, networks that previously, for cost reasons, might have been um, uh, disparate, um, uh, permitting the storage uh, uh, and processing of data to occur almost any place on the planet, separate from the vendor and from the end user. Combining these three uh, creates a complicated um, policy environment um, by any measure. And when you add to it the fact that much of the consumer data is highly sensitive and highly valued uh, by the consumer, um, it supercharges that, uh, that policy environment. No one knows for sure, but if you had to sort of oversimplify, you'd probably say about 25% of all cloud computing is purely entirely within a single jurisdiction, which is to say no, it touches no other jurisdiction than, than, than one. And even in that environment, um, there are complicated and new policy issues that are difficult to think through, such as who really owns the data? Who really has a right to um, retrieve it or modify it? Um, is there such a thing as a, uh, a cloud service for consumers that's too big to fail? If you reach the point where tens of millions of people have the most valuable information about their lives and family on a, uh, a network, um, can you really say that uh, we can simply um, ignore the fact that um, that network will go down and the, and the data is lost? These are complicated issues for um, any jurisdiction to try to think about. But when you uh, put that into a multinational environment where 75% of all of this is occurring, um, you're then moving from a game of chess to a game of three-dimensional chess. And in fact, it is that th game of three-dimensional chess which the people in this panel um, have been looking at and trying to figure out how best to play. Um, let me spend a minute and introduce them, and we'll get right into the uh, discussion. Each um, panelist is going to have opening remarks. Um, we may have some uh, discussion among the panel uh, or questions from me, after which we will open it up to uh, questions from the floor. If you have questions, um, there are two important things, three important things I need to remind you of. First is questions must come from the microphone, which is in the center of the room, so please go to the microphone. Second, um, please introduce yourself. Um, if you have an affiliation, state it. If you don't, simply give us your name. And third, um, uh, please uh, pose a question that the panel can um, respond to. Um, let me begin with um, Ed Felton, immediately to my left. Um, Ed is a, uh, uh, the first um, a chief technologist at the Federal Trade Commission. This is a new position, which has gotten a lot of public attention, and I think sort of reflects the fact that the FTC recognizes that uh, cloud computing and the, uh, the IT space is having an enormous impact on, on consumer protection. And um, he really began his work um, just one week ago, so he's uh, fresh on the job. Um, uh, Ed's kind of in a unique position because he's dealing not only with the theory of how all this fits together, but in both the FTC's rulemaking and enforcement uh, activities, um, he uh, has become and will become increasingly involved. Um, uh, he's, this is, he's on a leave of absence from Princeton University, um, where he is a uh, professor of uh, policy and uh, computer science, and is the author of um, over 80 published articles uh, on the subject of uh, information technology, which means that for a relatively young guy like him, at his age, he's probably written more articles on information technology than most people will in their lifetime read. Uh, to, <laughs> to, his left, to his left is an equally distinguished panelist, Ambassador Phil Verveer, um, is the coordinator of international communication and information policy at the U.S. Department of State. Um, Ambassador Revere deals with bilateral and multilateral relationships in the IT, ICT space, um, uh, which means that, again, um, he has to deal with these um, issues in the real world of what other countries think, how to mesh what we're doing with other countries. 
previously Ambassador uh, Rivera practiced communications and antitrust law for 40 years. Um, and uh, I think if anyone looks at his bio and the bios of all three panelists are on the, the, uh, the uh, website for the conference, but um, y y you really have to reach a conclusion is, uh, that if it's important, um, he's probably done it in this area. He was the uh, bureau chief at the Federal Trade Commission for the cable, broadcast, and consumer uh, carrier, common carrier bureaus and he was the lead uh, Department of Justice uh, attorney in the historic antitrust case um, involving ATT. Um, third, um, and at the far, uh, to my far left, to your far right, uh, Jim Dempsey is the head of CDT West, um, the Center for Democracy Techno and Technology, is the sort of leading um, civil society organization um, in the world, really, but certainly in the United States in this, uh, in this area. He's the former executive director of CDT. Um, he previously was on the staff of the House Judiciary uh, Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights. And he's currently helping organize a digital due process coalition, which is calling on Congress to update the Electronic Communications and Privacy Act, ECPA, which for those who don't know, it really is the foundation law that protects uh, privacy in the email and, and, and many of the consumer environments. Um, so with that introduction, um, I'm going to um, ask Ed to begin by giving us um, some, some comments, and then we'll go right to Ambassador Revere and um, Jim. Thanks. Uh, so the first question to ask is, what is new or different about cloud computing as compared to other uh, technology areas? Uh, and to some extent, cloud computing represents a continuation of existing trends in the tech world. Uh, more data being stored, more data being moved around, uh, more data being processed, more people using technology for more different purposes, uh, and technology moving into more places via more mobile devices, and so on. All of these are trends that have been going on for a long time, and cloud computing takes some of the blame or gets some of the credit for those, tr for those long-standing trends. Um, but I think if you look at what is really unique or special or different about the cloud, uh, you end up with uh, two. Um, by my list, although it's a different way of organizing it from yours, um, uh, two main um, factors. One is that your data is stored in more places than it was stored before. Uh, because the cloud is not just a movement between uh, of data on the end user computer into a data center. It really reflects a replication of data. Data is stored in a data center and on your uh, personal computer and on your laptop and on your mobile device and uh, potentially available for uh, privacy or security problems in any or all of those places. Um, the, the second big difference is that the number of parties, organizations that are involved in the handling of your data uh, increases by at least one when you move to the cloud. You have the cloud provider who's a new party who plays a new kind of role. And um, to the extent that the challenges of managing security and privacy are about the different parties and their relationships and their interactions, uh, all of those get more difficult when you add one more party, uh, perhaps sometimes going from two to three or four parties who uh, have their hands right on the data. Now, of course, the cloud provides important benefits, and it's easy in a panel like this to slip into the trap of saying the cloud is a big problem we need to solve, and if only it would just go away, we'd be happier. Um, we, should be, we should welcome this, uh, on the whole, as a technology trend that makes things a lot better for consumers and for companies, provided that the security and privacy issues are, are managed. Okay, so let's look at those two differences, the data being in more places and the change in the number of parties in the equation, and, and look in more detail at what they mean from a policy standpoint. First, data stored in more places. Each place that your data is stored is potentially a place where something could go wrong. Uh, but in many respects, the problem of defending that data, um, making sure that it's properly and safely managed in those places is similar to what it was before. The problem of protecting data on your desktop computer or in a data center or on your mobile device um, is a problem that we've had to look at before. Um, and so although we need to be more vigilant because there are more things that can go wrong, uh, I think there are not major changes in the technical aspects of security that we need to put in place with the cloud. 
Uh, things get more interesting, I think, when we look at the relationships and the role of the cloud provider, this new kind of party in the, uh, uh, in the ecosystem, and the relationship that they have with a service provider or with the end user. Um, we need to have clear expectations about the responsibilities of the cloud provider, and those expectations need to be understood between the cloud provider and between the other players who are involved. Uh, and this adds complexity when you have more parties. The kinds of safeguards that you have in relationships about data uh, are going to need to adjust um, so that there are new kinds of questions that you have to ask. And if you are uh, an end user or uh, an institution who, um, who is um, moving into the cloud or thinking of moving into the cloud, you need to think about different kinds of um, technical and legal relationships. Providers um, of, of services will need to... To, to put more attention on these sort of relationship and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, contractual issues. As data increases in uh, scope, as data is held more widely, and as it gets mobile. Now, this is an area in which the FTC has been thinking and, um, uh, and in some cases, acting for a while. Um, but uh, I don't think it... Uh, involves a major change in the policy approach. Uh, as always, companies that hold consumer data are going to have to be responsible for protecting that data adequately. Um, we, uh, the FTC has not gone down the road of trying to get overly specific in mandating specific technologies or specific solutions. I don't think that's going to change. Um, companies will continue to have a basic, a basic responsibility to, uh, to take adequate measures to protect uh, da private data of consumers. And it's also going to continue to be important uh, from an FTC standpoint to engage in consumer education to make sure that consumers understand what the options are, what the trade-offs are, and what questions they should be asking uh, in order to make sure that their, their data is, is safe. Uh, this is, of course, part of the FTC's broader examination of privacy that has been going on uh, for some time. The, uh, uh, the uh, uh, FTC released a staff report, a draft staff report on privacy at the end of November. Um, and we're eager for all of your comments at the end of this month. Um, there are a, a number of key issues that are discussed in that report um, rel relevant to cloud computing. Um, it's uh, one key issue is how consumers can have an effective understanding of uh, what deals they're making when their data goes online, effective understanding of the implications of the choices that they're making, and how consumers can have effective, really effective choice about how their data will be handled uh, despite the increasing complexity of the technical and uh, organizational arrangements uh, surrounding that data. Uh, this is an area in which I and the FTC as an agency are eager to talk to stakeholders. Uh, many of you are stakeholders, and we, we and I are eager to hear from you about this, and I look forward to discussion with all of you and with my fellow panelists. Ambassador Greer. Right, thank you. Um, in terms of my uh, particular responsibilities, uh, cloud computing and its implications are invariably on the list of subjects for our bilateral engagements, uh, an example of which would be uh, next month's Information Society Dialogue with the European Commission uh, in Brussels. Um, the cloud obviously offers enormous efficiency benefits, uh, but there's one aspect of it that I think um, is uh, especially important and somewhat different, and that is its ability to permit uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and consumers to uh, access state-of-the-art infrastructure and software. In other words, in addition to the other uh, activities that, um, that we're describing, uh, the second thing that Roger mentioned, the uh, the ability of consumers to use this is something that has very large implications, I think, juridically, both on a national level and certainly on an international level. Now, as Ed just said, privacy policy is a preoccupation on this side of the Atlantic, and it is, as most of you would know, uh, also on the other side of the Atlantic and throughout the world. Um, due to changes in technology, changes in commercial practice, uh, changes in consumer behavior. Uh, the EU is, of course, engaged in a, a very important data privacy consultation right now. As Ed said, the Federal Trade Commission and also our Commerce Department uh, have just issued uh, very important uh, reports that they're uh, uh, obtaining uh, comments on. So that we have um, uh, the, uh, uh, the concerns about privacy generally 
And the fact that we've got uh, increasing amounts of personal information being held in the cloud, and because of the transborder nature of the cloud, we have, uh, I think, heightened privacy concerns. Simultaneously, we have concerns by law enforcement agencies and security agencies about the increased adoption of new architectures and IP-related approaches that uh, complicate the uh, responsibilities that they have. Um, their concerns being, I suppose, uh, summarized as timely access to communications uh, and also um, uh, something that we see uh, increasingly in my work, a pressure to locate facilities in country, both for uh, jurisdictional reasons and also for practical reasons. Now, these concerns, obviously, are going to be met with countervailing concerns about the security of personal information. For example, uh, will individual information be accessed by governments without notice? Now, what to do in light of these considerations? Um, we want to urge, and we do urge, all administrations to try to approach these issues collaboratively. Um, we have a goal of trying to find ways genuinely to protect privacy interests that do not uh, unnecessarily impair the efficiencies that are available in cloud architecture and cloud services. We also have a goal to find ways to meet legitimate law enforcement and security requirements, both national and international, without unnecessarily impairing the cloud efficiencies. Now, complete harmonization is really not a realistic goal. Um, but improving the proximity of policies, um, improving practice in areas of cooperation, uh, and in some areas at least mutual recognition of adequacy are realistic goals. And those are three things that we try to work on constantly in our bilateral and multilateral uh, undertakings. Now, with the cloud, one of the first of the international undertakings has to be to agree on what practical issues take priority. Uh, and I know Jim is going to speak to uh, important questions about jurisdiction. I can tell you that in terms of the uh, efforts that we've undertaken to uh, try to understand what the most important issues are in an international realm, uh, I've been surprised that issues like choice of law, venue for adjudication, uh, questions about mandatory uh, arbitration or not, have not actually been the biggest issues that um, are uh, companies and our governmental uh, uh, interlocutors want to uh, discuss. For them, the biggest issues seem to be privacy, security of data in storage and in transmission, um, the storage and location of data and services, so location is very important, um, as, well as, uh, as well as certain other things. Um, our legal advisor's office has undertaken a study of uh, the commercial uh, contracts that are available uh, in consumer uh, environments, that is, non-negotiated contracts, take it or leave it, terms and conditions. Uh, and this has exposed at least 20 different areas of importance uh, in terms of trying to understand the business of offering cloud services and therefore quite obviously uh, important areas in terms of the business of trying to get as close as we can to harmonized activities. So I'm uh, particularly interested in hearing what Jim has to say about the jurisdictional issues, which are, as you might imagine, a particular interest to in the State Department. Jim? Well, that's no burden. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ambassador Revere, thanks for uh, setting it up, and Roger, thanks for uh, moderating this panel. Um, you know, it is, it, cloud uh, does bring back this um, this long-standing and still unsettled in many ways uh, question of uh, jurisdiction, and in terms of thinking about um, what is different and what is not different about the cloud. So uh, Ed is correctly, uh, even Roger, um, you know, okay, everybody's been doing some form of shared resources forever and. Um, the cloud shouldn't change that much, which is a point that I, I think I'll conclude with, but getting there is a difficult path, I think, because as, as I think about um, <clears throat> privacy issues, I tend to divide them into the sort of commercial use, access, and responsibility questions, uh, what you might think of as the uh, consumer uh, privacy issues, as well as the sort of B2B liability responsibility issues. And then I think in terms of the uh, 
uh, government access issues, which in the United States, at least, the legal framework there starts with the Fourth Amendment concepts and then is uh, implemented imperfectly in legislation through the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. So sort of the, the issues of um, privacy and security, uh, B2C and B2B, and then the, the question of uh, governmental access. And in both of those, I think the question is, that sort of one way to look at the jurisdictional issue is, when does uh, geography matter and when should geography not matter? That is the geography of where the data uh, resides. And in this respect, on the consumer side, and, and maybe on the B2B side, I haven't thought about that so much, but on the B2C side, the EU framework, um, for all of its uh, problems, I think the EU framework does have a, a, a very good concept in terms of the distinction between the data controller and the data processor. Um, so the cloud service provider in, in European terms should be thought of, in my view, as the data processor. Europe, by the way, has screwed this up um, and has, the, the, you know, the Article 29 Working Party has come up with this concept of the joint controller um, and has in many cases designated as controller, uh, for example, social networking sites, which I really think should be thought of as data processors. Uh, to the extent they host user-generated content. Um, hopefully, as soon as I can get the damn thing finished, um, CDT will issue a memo trying to sort through all of this uh, stuff about um, data controller and data processor and how it could be done correctly under the European uh, model and uh, addressing the, the uh, Article 29 uh, Working Party opinions on uh, processor and uh, controller and social networking. But anyhow, just take the, 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 the basic concept of data controller and data, data processor. Under the EU directive, most or all of the privacy and security obligations fall on the data controller. That would be the person who collects the data. Generally speaking, in very gross terms, the, the person who has the, the relationship with the consumer, let's say. Interestingly and appropriately enough, and, and, and the data processor processes the data pursuant to the directions of the data controller and can only process the data pursuant to the directions of the data of controller. Um, in some cases, of course, a person is both controller and processor, where they do everything in-house, then you're both controller and processor. Um, but the cloud situation or any outsourcing situation, you have um, a, a controller and a processor. And the controller doesn't avoid and cannot avoid its responsibilities based upon the geography of where the data is stored. Now, Europe, of course, has uh, gotten uh, completely tied up in geography in the wrong way and in a way that they're trying to, I think, pull back from or at least uh, mitigate in their ongoing review of the, of the directive. But the people talk about who owns the data. And as a privacy advocate, I've always thought that the ownership um, concept was a very limited concept in terms of defining uh, privacy responsibilities. I remember the example of the, the company, the social networking company, um, who will go unnamed for the second for this moment, but they had their privacy policy that said, you, the customer, own your data. By using our service, you hereby give us a worldwide, royalty-free, transferable, paid-up, uh, irrevocable license to use our data, to use your data however we want. So what good did it matter that you owned it? By using the service, you would just, I mean, if, if you own it, remember, if you own it, you can alienate it. If you own it, you can sell it. If you own it, you can, you can get rid of it. Um, so ownership only gets you so far, not very far at all. The better idea is custodianship. And I think modern privacy law, um, correctly understood, uh, operates on the concept of uh, custodianship as opposed to ownership, and that the custodianship responsibility falls on uh, the entity who is um, 
collecting the data and responsible for its processing, that is the data controller, regardless of where the data resides. Now, the interesting um, exam uh, um, exception there, even under this European framework, is that the security responsibilities fall not only on the data controller, but also the data processor. So the data controller clearly has a responsibility, even under US law, under FTC uh, uh, common law uh, of data security, any entity that collects and holds or uses or discloses or processes uh, personal information is responsible for the security of that information within some rough parameters defined on a case-by-case -case basis by the um, FTC. And if you process the data in the basement of your building or if you process it across the street or if you process it around the world, you're still responsible for take, understanding and maintaining some not very well-defined level of security. Um, and, but the data processor is also responsible for security. It's not like the data processor has zero responsibility. Um, so if you hold yourself out as doing business of uh, data processing, you do, it'll be an interesting um, FTC case for the pure B2B situation, but I think the current law would say that it would be an unfair and deceptive trade practice to be a B purely B2B cloud provider and not provide adequate security. Contract aside, um, and contract is powerful, although obviously not completely uh, a solution here. I was reading a report, um, an otherwise good report put out a, a couple of years ago on cloud computing, and it talked about HIPAA and said, in some cases, the substantive requirements of HIPAA will directly conflict with a cloud provider's terms of service. A service provider cannot disclose uh, or use health records in a way that conflicts with the HIPAA standards. Thus, a HIPAA, HIPAA covered entity could violate HIPAA by storing patient records at a cloud provider with terms of service that allow the provider to use the data in a way violative of HIPAA. Well, of course, um, no HIPAA covered entity, I think, would ever enter into a, a cloud um, uh, agreement without making sure that the HIPAA, that the cloud provider is HIPAA compliant and they'll have a contract that defines that. And if the, if the cloud provider wants to get any uh, business holding medical data, they are going to have to make sure that they can say that they are providing security at least equal to what uh, the health, the covered entity would be required to provide uh, on its own. So the, to some extent, contract um, deals with that. Um, so I think that in thinking about cloud, I think that the important thing to do, which we do on all internet issues, is to start with the existing legal framework. That is to start with the offline rules um, and then identify any gaps that need to be uh, filled. Um, I think we have identified, we, the, the Digital Due Process Coalition, have identified a, uh, a clear gap in terms of the distinction between the way that ECBA covers um, locally stored information, or at least the Fourth Amendment protects locally stored information versus the treatment of uh, cloud content. So for those of you who haven't followed the work of our Digital Due Process Coalition uh, under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, um, the, the government, if it wants locally stored data, as I say, they have to do it the way it's done on TV. You go to a judge, get a warrant, knock, knock, police, open up, we have a warrant, the bad guy doesn't open up, or you hear the toilet flushing, you kick in the door, you run in, you've got the warrant, etc. cetera. Um, in the white collar example, usually they just serve a subpoena, but they serve a subpoena on the record subject if you're holding data in-house. Under ECBA, data stored in the cloud is available without a warrant and with a subpoena stored not on the record holder or the record subject, the record creator, but on the third party host and the third party host, the cloud service provider, can be prohibited from telling the um, record subject 
that uh, their data is being sought by the government. What's interesting about the Twitter uh, subpoena case, it wasn't really a subpoena, it was a court order in that case, but Twitter actually went and asked the judge to lift the gag order, and the judge did, and now the record subjects in that Twitter case can challenge it. In the normal cloud case, quite often the data holder does not notify the record subject, and they disclose the data without any intervention of a judge and without any <coughs> opportunity for the true party interest to challenge it. That needs to be uh, corrected. Um, I think the one thing that does work for the cloud, at least under US law, although it's under challenge internationally, is the concept of protecting intermediaries from liability for the content that they host. This has been a foundation of uh, internet policy law in the United States. It's also reflected in the European uh, e-commerce directive in that uh, hosts and conduits and caches are by and large protected. Um, the protection is more robust in the United States, but broadly speaking, at least compared to the rest of the world, Europe and the U.S. are on the same plane in um, holding that uh, intermediaries are not liable. The true party and interest is liable. The intermediary uh, can protect itself against uh, immune, uh, protect itself against liability for the content it's created, which of course is what allows YouTube and a host of other services to flourish without uh, having to uh, minutely monitor the data that they're holding. And I, I would think that the, the cloud issue might push, it certainly should push, for um, deeper international uh, harmonization on uh, privacy laws. So to some extent, the jurisdictional issues, enforcement remains a huge issue. But in terms of at least trying to figure out what the standards are, from a compliance point of view, worry separately about who enforces it when it goes wrong. But in terms of the standards, you know, again, I think there's a possibility, I, I think there is a growing convergence already between Europe and the US, and I think that uh, the cloud developments may drive more in that direction. Also, I would hope and urge that the cloud would serve to drive some progress on the cybersecurity issue have hope of harmonization on privacy. I'm merely hoping for progress on cybersecurity um, because it's, we sort of know what the privacy framework is. We're less certain of what are the security standards and how much security is enough security. But so you look at this new thing, the cloud, and it brings us back to the issues we've been grappling with all along, <coughs> privacy, uh, both government access as well as consumer, security, how much security is enough security, um, intermediary um, protection. Um, I think those issues, we need to get them right for reasons other than the cloud. Um, the cloud may drive some of the resolution of them. I don't think we need, we clearly don't need, clearly, arguably we don't need separate rules for the cloud, per se. Um, thank you. Let me begin by offering a couple of comments. Before um, anyone in the room uh, concludes that the subject of cloud computing and the rules for cloud computing is sort of an abstract, um, ethereal topic that uh, people theorize on, it, it's probably important to sort of remember um, that um, what we were talking about in this panel is essentially um, the rules that govern about 80% of all consumer email in the United States. Who owns it? What can be done with it? Where does it go? What happens if it disappears? We're also talking about virtually 100% of the data of in social networks, um, consumer social networks. Um, uh, and, and of that data, um, almost half the adult population in the United States today 
says it has a significant dependence upon social networks and the information in social networks. So the rules governing that and the ownership of that and the control over that are, are really the underlying issues we're talking about. And even an area as, as basic as travel reservations and records, um, about half of all travel reservations and records today are um, subject to the, the consumer travel reservations and records today are, are subject to this sort of cloud environment that we're describing. So while the subject, when we talk about it in uh, dissect it to, uh, technologically or, or in a regulatory sense, uh, may sound dry, the reality is, is anything but. Uh, the reality is something which affects in a, in a very meaningful way um, the lives of, of uh, a large percentage of the population in the United States and other countries. And if there's one thing you can say about politicians, it is that if something affects the voters in a significant way, they're going to wind up paying attention to it. With that introduction, let me ask, if I could begin by asking the panelists, um, what is it, if anything, that you think, um, uh, and maybe I shouldn't use the perjurator term politicians, but what is it, if anything, that you think that um, uh, the Congress or other um, uh, governments, um, legislators, or, or uh, policy-making entities um, can or should do that's constructive in this space? And you know, you can refer to the U.S. Congress in particular if you'd like, or you can just refer to the kind of uh, broad idea of legislatures or parliaments in any country. And let me ask any any panelist who would like to. Uh, 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 respond to that um, to please do so. Well, I had already thrown out our, um, I had already put out there our proposal for reform of uh, ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. I think at the very least it should be amended to make it clear that the various copies of that data that exist, so copy that you printed out and left on your desk, the copy that you have with you as you walk around, um, and the copy that is in the cloud, possibly in two or three places in the cloud, that all of those copies should be treated the same, and content is content is content. It should be uh, protected by the warrant requirement. That's what the Sixth Circuit held in the Warshak case in December. Uh, that covers only four states and 12, <coughs> 12 circuits. Um, I think that ECPA is probably, certainly the Sixth Circuit held that ECPA is unconstitutional to the extent that it uh, draws this distinction <coughs> between uh, locally stored data and the same data of equal sensitivity uh, remotely stored. The data, the bits passing over the wire are highly protected by the Wiretap Act. The, the bits that come to rest uh, are less protected. That is certainly, to my mind, a simple, clear change. Um, it's the law for email up to 180 days old in the Ninth Circuit. It's now the law for all email in the Sixth Circuit. I think it should be made the law nationwide. And by the way, talking about international leadership, this is one on which I think the U.S. government could show some significant leadership along the lines of Secretary Clinton's speech uh, just about a year ago. Um, I, let me open the floor for uh, questions. If you, if you um, have a question, please come up to the microphone and introduce yourself. While you're thinking about if you have questions, I'm going to pass one other quick question for the, um, for the panel. And, and, and that is, ask, I think as we discussed in the panel, a very common configuration um, is one in which you have the individual and the consumer space. You have the consumer, you have the service provider, and then you have the data operator sort of in the background, that the, the cloud and the data operator will often have processing and storage facilities in multiple locations, often different states or different countries, and they may move the data around. Um, very commonly, national governments uh, maintain that they should have a right to access data, and Jim has talked about this, for national security or other anti-terrorism or security reasons of any data in their country in order to inspect it if, if a law is being violated or, or 
um, any sure. such thing. It so happens that the result of that is that data of many, many Americans is moving around in many other countries. Um, and thus, it is a real issue to um, think about, uh, uh, and that is, to what extent should we, uh, the United States, uh, concede to other countries um, the right to um, inspect the data? And this, for those of you who followed the BlackBerry case will recall, this was a real issue that's come up. Um, to what extent should we, as a matter of U.S. policy, concede the right of other governments to inspect um, data that's being stored um, in their country or um, passing through their country um, for what they define as national security or um, counterterrorism um, reasons? And again, I'll throw that open to the panel. I think, Roger, um one can actually recast slightly uh, what you've just said, because our ability, uh, we may have some ability uh, on the level of articulation to object to the ability of a, another administration to get access to information that might be stored in that, uh, in that country, uh, but these objections are um, essentially on the level of articulation. So another way to think about it is, um, what kind of recourse do you have as a consumer if something goes wrong? What kind of recourse do you have uh, if somebody is either trying to or has gotten access to the information or has negligently done something to damage it? Um, where do you go? What court is going to help you as a practical matter? Um, uh, do you really have recourse? Um, these, are, um, these are quite serious questions. Um, when we talk about... Um, business to business activities, we talk about now big businesses, not small and medium sized enterprises. Um, they presumably will negotiate these contracts, they will try to, uh, they will try to uh, arrange for um, dealing with contingencies to the extent that they're foreseeable, and my guess is most courts will uh, honor the words and phrases you find in those kinds of contracts. But I think when we talk about uh, consumers, when we talk about small and medium sized enterprises, you have a very, very different picture. Um, and if you think about this from the standpoint of the provider, this becomes something that's very important. If you believe, and I think there is good reason to believe, that consumer protection laws in many, many uh, countries uh, would come to uh, upset the, uh, the standard form terms and conditions that are being offered, they would essentially not honor those. Um, then you have complexities with respect to uh, trying to uh, trying to derive and uh, and fully appropriate the efficiencies that are available in cloud services. Um, that's something that we need to worry about a good bit because those efficiencies, of course, are the things that make um, the state of the art software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, um, opportunities available to individuals and to small and medium sized enterprises. Something that um, uh, is plainly very, very advantageous from a material perspective. Now, we don't really have answers for those questions. Um, but what we do have, I think, is a virtual certainty that as problems arise, as inevitably they will, the courts and legal authorities all over the world are going to address these in terms of the way that uh, they regard as fair and appropriate outcomes under their consumer protection laws as they may exist. And we need to find some way, some way, to uh, try to bring these as much into harmony so that we can have common expectations uh, as possible. And we're very much at the beginning of that process right now. Yeah. Jim. I agree that we need to um, develop a, a better, um, stronger uh, U.S. position on um, privacy protections vis-a-vis -vis the government. Certainly, our government is never going to. Conundrum is our government's never going to give up its right to access data about um, non-citizens that resides in the United States. I mean, this is what the this is what the whole FISA debate was about in terms of the real-time cloud. So um, most of the real-time cloud, as well as most of the storage cloud, is in the United States, and a large percentage of the world's communications pass through the United States. Um, even foreign to foreign uh, communications where they're accessible to our government and our government insists upon the power and the right and authority to um, access those communications whether they're stored or, or real time. And I just don't see them ever, ever giving that up. Um, 
Now, at that point there, I think China and India have exactly the same claim, that if it's sitting in China, it's sitting in India, if it passes through them, and if somehow the 20 years from now, the cables run differently um, and the fiber runs differently, um, I just don't see how we can possibly say that China shouldn't have the same power we have. Um, I think all we have is the, the rule of law. And um, clearly we, we sort of gave that up for a number of years post 9-11, and I think that hurt us uh, badly. Um, I'm, I would hope that we could begin or continue the process of reasserting that with, in the United States, strong standards for the access to that data which is physically available to us, um, strong standards for compelling those service providers who have a presence in the United States to uh, cooperate. Obviously, it's, it's way beyond the subject of this discussion, but a whole other piece of this is um, the extent to which the U.S. government tries to exercise design control over those service providers. Um, let me switch, if I can, to the domestic um, side and, and, and just sort of ask a question for, for anyone on the panel. This may be more relevant to the FTC, but uh, I think for, for everyone, and that is in it's, it's common in business planning to examine the position of your competitors and see where there are opportunities. So if everybody in the airline business, if all of my competitors are high-cost airlines, then there may be an opportunity for me to offer a low-cost airline. And if uh, everybody's uh, offering expensive coffee, then I may try to open up an inexpensive coffee shop. So we, we know just the way business works and just looking at the, the way the, the, the Internet works, that in the area of social networking, which is so important to consumers, that much of the uh, uh, market today is, is dominated by providers who have high standards for um, security, high standards for reliability and security. It, and, and it would be unrealistic to think that somebody isn't thinking that they could compete by offering a lower cost structure, which is achievable through lower security standards. Um, this would uh, permit them to offer the same product at a lower price, and the, and the price here is paid by the advertiser, by the way, not the consumer. The, you know, they could get as many eyeballs for fewer dollars or get more eyeballs for the same dollars. Um, so th there is a natural opportunity in the marketplace for competitors to think about lower cost structure and lower security um, as a means of, of uh, uh, competing. Um, is, is there anything in the uh, uh, environment today that would uh, prevent or discourage that from happening, or is that something which we should simply expect to occur as part of the, 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 the market forces? Uh, I think if a company slid, if a hypothetical company slid far enough down that scale uh, toward being uh, really reckless with the security of their customers' personal data or uh, misrepresenting to consumers what protections they had in place, the FTC would certainly take notice. Um, there, uh, um, well, let me just stop there. If the if the if the vendor were uh, candid and said, "Listen, you know, we're," they would they would tell the advertisers, "You know, our rates are half of what everybody else's are." They would tell the consumers in that little thing you click on with 18 pages of text. Um, and by the way, we make no claims about the security of this. Would 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 the same principle apply? Well, let's see. Without, um, I, I know this is a theoretical, but no, in the real market, it's a theoretical it's legal it's question for a non-lawyer. Non but let me. The question yeah. has been the question has been asked and answered. It was answered in the Sears case. A, it was answered in the Sears case, and before that, it was answered in the other security cases where the person where the companies made no promise about security and yet were find, found liable. Uh, for engaging in unfair and deceptive trade practices for taking data and not giving it adequate security. What is adequate is not defined, but it is clear that, um, well, again, I always say that it's clear, and then I start thinking. Um, could a company say, write up, forget about the 18 pages. The 18 pages one is easy, because if you bury the 18 pages, you lose, um, which is the Sears case. Um, if you say, you know, 
we fly our airplanes without security inspections, but it's really inexpensive. You can't do that because we regulate the airlines. But um, we hold your data without security protections, and it's, but it's really inexpensive. Um, Again, you can't function, nobody can use your services on that basis because the, the entity that, and, and, except it, it, maybe if they're doing, I guess if they're doing that in a, in a B2C context. Yeah, there, there are really two things yeah. you can say about this, I think, reliably. The, the first thing is most standard terms and conditions, the take it or leave it things that consumers confront, disclaim any responsibility yeah. for anything. So you have disclaimers of, of, that are extraordinarily broad for reasons that you can understand if you were a provider. The second thing you can say about it is this, that one of the well-known reasons for market failure is informational problems. And we're talking about things now that are frankly beyond the level of interest and perhaps even beyond the level of understanding of most consumers. So you have a, a kind of classic circumstance where there are reasons to suspect that market failure could occur. So it, it is a very, um, it's a very relevant question that Roger has put, and it's one that I'm reasonably confident our friends at the Federal Trade Commission are going to find lots of opportunities to deal with in the yeah. future. Uh, we have only a few minutes left, and uh, did you want to say anything else, Ed? No, just, uh, maybe just one last quick thing. Um, so uh, Jim put up this hypothetical of the company that says, give us your data and we'll be entirely cavalier with it. Anything could happen. You might as well just be broadcasting it, right? Which is an interesting thought experiment, but I think unlikely to happen. Companies always, I, in my experience, companies find themselves wanting to say that there's some level of protection that they're providing. If your purpose as a consumer is to broadcast your data, they'll say, we'll broadcast yeah. your data. Yeah. Um, so there will be some representation But you could there. see Roger's situation in the, um, so in the consumer context, you always want to, you either want to be silent on security, in which case you're required to protect, or you want to say we protect, in which case you're required to protect. Um, but you could see Roger's scenario of the competitive situation, particularly one step removed from the consumer, where there's a competitive drive to the bottom, um, certainly the data controller, again, to use my framework, the European framework, the data controller remains under some obligation, you know, not to pick the lowest bidder almost. Right. In the European context. You know, in the American context, since the data controller is I, right. the, the person who has the responsibility for the data, they are under an obligation whether they keep it in-house or outsource it, they are responsible for the security of that data to some extent. I'm afraid we are uh, just about out of time. Um, and I, uh, please join me in thanking the uh, panel for um, an excellent discussion of a complicated subject. <laughs>